October 4th, 5th, and 6th. So sign-ups need to be done by, or before May 1st, so hurry up and do that. Also, we have our ladies' breakfast on Saturday, April 20th at 9 a.m. So you guys, ladies, come down and uh, enjoy some breakfast fellowship and uh, hearts blessed by Tabitha Carter, who's going to be sharing. On Saturday, April 20th, is the Awana Grand Prix pit party. So if you guys buy your cars at Awana and then want to help get those built or need tools, things like that, then you can come down Saturday and then people will help you out. It's from 9, 9 a.m. until noon. And uh, that will be on Saturday. Er, the Awana Grand Prix is on Saturday, May 4th. We also have a new friends luncheon. So if you've been here for the past seven to nine months, don't really know too much about the church or haven't got to meet the leadership, uh, this is a great way for us to fellowship together, share a meal, and then talk amongst the leadership of the church. And uh, yeah, so you're invited to, to that. Signups are in the foyer with Marie Lennon. So Jeff has an announcement real quick. Yeah, and we also have the VBS signups are on the information station on the left side. Uh, there, there's a little bulletin for that. It's the Wild Frontier. So I encourage you guys, we need leaders to be signing up for that. We're going to have a meeting here towards the end of April to kind of just go over a few things and then talk about that. So I encourage you guys, if you're a- able to come for that week, uh, the 15th through the 19th, I encourage you guys in July to come out and help with that. So please, please sign up. And then we also have a special announcement from the Roddies. Good morning. Some of you may be wondering, you've seen a few of these floating around, and we just want to let you know that um, there is one who loves life. He's the author of life. God of the universe, the God of the heavens, the creator, he's the one who has given life, and not just physical life, but spiritual life through his son, Jesus Christ. And we just want to share with you a little bit this morning about his heart from a psalm, and then uh, explain a little bit more about what we're doing with these. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. For the night will shine like day, for darkness is a light to you. For you created my most being, You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Thank you so much. That is just a small portion of God's heart that he wanted to share with us this morning. And I uh, want you to know that uh, there is a wonderful ministry in this Puget Sound area called CareNet. I don't know if you've heard about it or not before, but their uh, annual report just came out from last year, from 2023. It's an amazing ministry. Over uh, 11,200 clients were served last year, and they received a 100% satisfaction rate from those who filled out their evaluation. They prayed 100%. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Saying, I'm so glad I met with you today. I'm so glad that you shared with me the resources so that I can make the best decision um, for what I'm going through right now. They prayed with over 3,800 of those clients, and 12 people are in God's kingdom and in his family and made a profession of faith because of this ministry. It's life-changing, not just for the to-be parents, to-be grandparents, for society as a whole, but also for God's family to grow. It's an amazing ministry. Um, it can be a scary thing. When you, uh, you realize and you see for the first time as a to-be father or to-be mother and you see uh, I'm pregnant, you see those little lines on that test, it can be a very emotional thing that you're going through, whether through guilt um, or, <laughs> wow, finally, or how's this going to work? And um, it can be a, an interesting time to go through. And some individuals, when they find themselves in that situation, they go, is there a way out? Is there a way out? The only safe thing is the right thing. As you heard from God's heart this morning from Psalm 139, he loves each and every child, whether born or unborn. He loves his creation. He's the author of life, the giver of life. And uh, through their uh, 1,200 volunteers, they've volunteered over 25,000 hours last year. That's a lot of time spent. They have a 24-hour hotline for anybody who is experiencing and needing resources to make a life-affirming choice to choose life. Um, they offer many different uh, classes, infant loss support, consultations, men's programs, parenting programs, and healthy relationship education, making wise choices with our bodies. We can honor the Lord with them. It's a wonderful ministry that my wife and I have been uh, a part of in a small sense for the last 10 years, and we're very encouraged to see others join in this ministry. You may be asking, well, what is that? What about me? Well, there's three ways that you could get involved. Um, there's those that serve behind the scenes or even serving directly with clients. They have a prayer support team. And if you're interested in doing that, sign up. Say, you know, what? I'll be in prayer for those who are making life decision choices and are on the fence and trying to understand what the best choice would make. There's a third option, and that's through financial support. Right now, they're in the uh, developing stages of beginning a clinic in the South uh, Kitsap area think up Tremont Trillium area. It's We're praying that this would be an opportunity because a lot of the clients they serve are right around this area. And uh, so it's kind of a, an exciting time. I don't know if you feel it in my voice, but I'm excited about this. Um, would you take one of these as you leave from here, if you haven't already, and uh, prayerfully, what would you have me do? What would be my part? I just heard that life is heart, and so I want it to be precious to mine as well. Uh, at our home, this will going to be at the breakfast table, lunch, and dinner table, and uh, we'll pass it around, and each one person will pray that day for this ministry, for the women and men who are involved in a situation where maybe they didn't think there is a way out, but guess what? There is a way. There is one way, and his name is Jesus, and the volunteers know that, and they point people to Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing that we can be a part of through this in, uh, in sharing in this ministry. So prayerfully consider grabbing one of these on your way out and talking with Joni and the other volunteers that give you a little bit more information about this ministry. All righty, speaking of prayer, let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. A beautiful sunrise this morning for able to being able to see your creation and that you love life. God, thank you that we are here today. I, I just pray that our fellowship is glorifying to you, that our worship is glorifying to you. Lord, I, I do pray for our, our daily bread ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you for all that they do. Praying that they will continue to share the good news of God's love, grace, and forgiveness all over the world by this little booklet, little da daily devotionals. Pray for Sam and uh, Mary Quartz and Village Missions in De Deer Trail, Colorado. 
pray for the ripple of impact on the community from the Easter services. Pray that 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 message will affect people in their lives, that they will, for their retirement at the end of June, pray for their congregation and deacon board during the transition of the head pastor stepping out and getting a new one. For the right missionary couple to be approached or to be appointed to their church to come in and, and fill that role. God, just help that church to continue to grow and to prosper. God, we also pray for uh, the vacation schools coming up. And pray for the teachers, helpers, game leaders, snack coordinators, and, and all the kids that will be there. God, we just be with uh, the pastors that will be sharing the messages and, and all of us working for that. And the kids as they come, that their hearts will be prepared to be gospel truth. God, I do just pray for us today that our hearts and our minds will be focused on and that your word will will help us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm trading my soul. some instrumental changes here real quick who heard bells or the, the the church bell this morning all right that's good we're trying to get it where we can hear that in here and 
call people into worship. So I'm glad that you guys are able to hear that. you to stand as we prepare to read our, our unison verses this morning. This comes uh, from Psalms, not very far from where the Roddy girls read this morning. We're going to read a whole chapter, but don't worry, it is short. Um, this is a really interesting one where David paints some amazing word pictures for us. He starts off talking about uh, unity, and he immediately goes back to the Torah, to Genesis, and he snags a phrase that's repeated there at the beginning of Genesis. The first time is about Abraham and his nephew Lot, and then Abraham's grandchildren, Jacob and Esau. And both of those passages in, in the Torah say they could not live together in unity. And if you're familiar with those stories, they could not. David takes that and flips it. He uses that as that phrase, but it says how good it is to you to live in unity. He uses that same phrasing, but he turns it around. And then he talks about these word pictures. He talks about Aaron being anointed, and, and it kind of might get lost on us here in a modern culture, but there's a very fragrant aspect to what's happening during that anointing and an and a implication of holiness in that part. And then he goes, mountain, not one that's close. He's talking about a mountain that's far away and how the dew and the precipitation on that mountain, even though it's over there, it affects us. And I see that in our church all the time. We are a local church. We're not even that big of a church, but boy, do we have a global impact because of the unity that we have together as we fund all of these missionary adventures that, that go out. So that is our verse this morning. So let's read it together. 
Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded life forevermore. We're going to sing those words here in a second. It's probably a new song to most people. I'm going to go through once. It's a really easy song, and then we'll sing it together. pleasant it is for the people to dwell together in unity together in unity how good and how pleasant it is for the people to dwell together in unity together You may be 
seated. In second grade and below are dismissed for children's church. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we give you thanks that through the Holy Spirit, we can be a unified congregation, Father. We know that the things that you have used Burley Church for is not because of all the individual things that we bring, but it's because you have taken all of us together individually as separate ingredients and brought us together into one loaf, into one body. We praise you. We ask that you continue to do that work amongst our congregation, that we may be unified together moving forward and continue to be a local church with a global impact. Amen. We are continuing on in our study in the book of Colossians, and we're in chapter 3. Um, we started chapter 3, getting our hearts and minds set above, and then Paul directed us to work on changing our clothes. Um, last week, we dealt with those clothes that need to be taken off and put into the burning barrel and destroyed, right? Putting to death the things of the earth, and I... I we are people with a sin nature, even as those who've been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Our sin nature has not gone away from us. Um, I, I remember in my early years of growing in Christ, I, you know, would look at the sin in the world and, and just think, wow, I just, man, I'd be glad when that's all done. And as I've walked with Christ for 50 plus years now, I go, and I'll sure be glad when the sin inside Jeff Olive is done. Um, we struggle with it. Uh, we, uh, we are, um, all of us do. And so this process of putting those things to death is not a one-time event. Wish it was. Um, and it will be someday in its completeness when he calls us home. Um, but we wrestle with that. And so, you know, as you remove those things, as you repent, as you turn to God, there's that need for cleansing, which he provides, 1 John 1, 9. And, and then there's a change of heart and mind. I need to have that attitude change. And when those things have taken place, you are ready to put on the new self. You're, you're ready to put on the new clothes that God has for us. Um, there's a couple things that... If I get lost in the message, I don't, I don't want you to miss um, because I think they're, uh, they're a priority. Uh, one is found in verse 14, right? He says, over all these virtues put on love, right? I mean, the, all, of, all of what we're going to talk about today is connected by love. And, and so really love is the, is the overarching focus and one of the things you'll see in this passage as well as we've seen throughout the book of Colossians is Paul is constantly reminding us to give thanks, to give thanks. Um, how has complaining worked for you? Has it, has it, has it gained you a lot? <laughs> I, it, we, it's easy to find things to complain about. That's, that's not difficult. I can complain about myself. I can complain about a job, I can complain about others, I can complain about the world, the country, I, you name it. I can complain about our leadership. I, you, you could go on and on complaining for hours if you so desired. I'm just not sure where it gets you. And, and those two things, you know, focusing on God's love for us that we might share that love and doing so with a heart of gratitude. Um, they're big. They're big for this. And I, I think before we look into the passage, too, a couple things to remember. We're, Paul's going to start this passage with a remembering who you are, because I, I think it's really important to know who you are when you're putting on these new clothes. And, and one of the things you need to always remember is you are a sinner saved by grace. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't get past that in our struggle. We, we don't reach a place where, uh, you know, I don't really need God's grace today because I've arrived 
Uh, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And that's, that's why the putting off the old self is something that we continue to do. But the second thing, and, and sometimes people get stuck in the sinner to save by grace portion of who you are and don't get the other truth, which is you are a child of God and he loves you. You are a child of the king of the universe and he loves you. Those two truths need to be in our heart and mind as we go through this clothes changing process. So now that you're all settled, will you stand with me as we read Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against an another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonition, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, we do stop and give you thanks. God, we are thankful for the many blessings that you have poured into our lives. We are most grateful for you giving your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, to take the penalty we deserved, and to rise again on the third day that we might have hope and life as we put our trust in him. We thank you, God, for giving us your word that we can Learn to know your mind and your will and your desire for us as we walk this earth. Everything we need to live for you is found in the pages of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for the unity of the Spirit that you give to us, and may we indeed make every effort to keep that unity. We thank you for the peace that is ours. Peace, Jesus, that you give, not as the world gives. It's a peace that surpasses understanding. And we thank you, God, for the time to share in your word this morning. Pray that you would use your word to change our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So we see in these first verses that we are a people who are belonging to God as the elect of God, holy and beloved, those who are chosen by God. By the way, when did he choose us? Ephesians 1.4, he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. God could look through the portals of time. Time is not an issue to him. He sees the beginning from the end. And he knew all of those who would call upon his name, and we belong to him. God knows us, and he's known us from the beginning. And when you think of this call, um, he, he says, you are holy. What, what does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart for God. That's the, the word holy meaning other or set apart or set above. God is thrice holy. He's set above all things. But he's chosen us to be holy, a people belonging to him, that we would live for him. Living for him is, is a part of what um, Paul is acknowledging us as. We are people who are chosen by God to live for God. Titus puts it this way. Titus 2.13 is the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, verse 14 says, who gave himself for us, 
to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I, when, Paul's acknowledging who we are. As a child of God, I am one who's been set apart by God for his purpose. I belong to him that I might live for him in my life. He has freed me from wickedness and given me a heart that's eager to follow him, to live for him. Holy and beloved, holy and dearly loved, this is who we are. Jude starts his little epistle saying, to those who are loved by God and kept by Jesus Christ. You and I are loved by God. How do you know that? Well, you ever hear this verse called John 3.16? Have you ever heard it? God so did what? Who? You? Me? Yeah. And he demonstrated that by giving his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, God loves us. I mean, he, he, he loves us and has offered himself for us. Uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for us to get through our, our thick skulls because we, we always try to measure things, you know, try to earn somebody's love or gain somebody's favor. And I'm, I'm telling you, you can't gain more favor and or love from God than he's already given you. God loves me. Um, David describes it in the 103rd Psalm as, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is God's love for those who fear him. God, God's love is as higher than you can imagine. I mean, you, you think about loving him and, and him loving us, bringing us into his family. To many as believed on him, those who call on the name of Jesus, right? He gave the right to become children of God. And in 1 John, John describes that as, as saying, how, how great is the love. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. That is who we are. You and I belong to a God who loves us. That's, that's good news. Given the fact that he is the creator of the universe, he is sovereign over all things, I'm, I'm thankful that he loves me. I'm thankful that he, he has chosen me and set me for his purpose. You know, when, when you are understanding that you're loved by God, understand that he has made us holy, that we would be set apart for him, allows us to live in true freedom. I want you to turn back to John's Gospel, chapter 8. And I've referenced this before, but I, I, I think this is such an important concept to sink in. John's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. And uh, this idea of living in true freedom and what that means. So here's what um, John writes for us. Verse 31 of chapter 8, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Um, ever hear that passage taken out of context? The truth shall make you free. Did you notice the prerequisite to that? If you believe him and if you abide by his word, meaning I walk in obedience to my God, I make, that's, that's when I become a disciple. And when I become a disciple, then I'm able to grasp the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, well look how the Jews responded. Verse 33, they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Well, Jesus says, well, no, you have been in bondage. Verse 34, he answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. 
Any of you ever commit a sin? That has made you a slave in bondage to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What is freedom? Freedom is being saved from my bondage and slavery to sin. Freedom is that ability to live the way I'm supposed to live, to live for the purpose God made me. To do. That's, that is true freedom in Christ. That's what it means to be free, is I can now live for God according to his purpose in his righteousness. That's what he's calling us to do. And so in that freedom, I, I now know my purpose, right? I mean, I, I know the purpose God has for me. In view of God's mercy, you're to offer your body as a what? A living sacrifice unto him. That, that, that's my purpose, is I give myself to him. I don't follow the pattern of this world anymore. I, I allow my mind to be transformed that I might know God's will. That, uh, uh, another verse um, from Hebrews 12 also, uh, verse 1, right? There's a great cloud of witnesses, and we're to you know, get rid of the hindrances, right, that, that are slowing us down and the sin that's entangling so we can do what? We can run the course, the race that God has marked out for us. You know, we, we heard the Roddy girls here quote um, the 139th Psalm. I, I love that Psalm. I, I remember when my family memorized it years ago and one of my daughters was about six years old at the time and we were out on our walk quoting the verse and, and, and she was pondering... Jesus sees my unformed body, and she said, well, what's, what's that about? And, you know, we were talking about how, you know, when you're, you start in your mommy's tummy and, and you're formed, and she goes, I get it. I get it. Jesus can see the unformed body because he's in your heart. The heart's right next to the stomach, and we're good to go, right? So she had it all figured out. I, I mean, Jesus is forming us, knitting us together in the womb, and he's made every one of us unique because he has a purpose for us. And, and freedom is knowing that purpose. I, I also, you know, we can get all wrapped up in the cares and the needs. You remember in the Matthew 6, Jesus talked about, you know, Solomon dressed in all his splendor didn't, didn't compare to the flowers of the field. And, you know, why do you worry about this? The, you know, God feeds the birds, they're here today, gone tomorrow. How much more will he care about you, right? I mean, uh, my, my daddy owns everything. Did, did you know that? Did you know that? Our Heavenly Father, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, we, we, we all belong to him. And you remember when, the, um, when Paul was writing when, from prison to the church in Philippi and they had sent him a gift and he was trying to thank him for the gift? And he said, well, not, not because of my need, but because it's a blessing to you. But he makes this, this interesting statement in chapter 4, verse 19. He says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I, I don't, God's going to take care of me. How many of you have a, testimony about God miraculously taking care of you. Anybody in this room? <laughs> yeah, look at the hands, right? I mean, we've, we've, if you've lived long enough, you've experienced that. God takes care of us. I don't have to be afraid anymore, right? Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that Jesus became like one of us and experienced death and conquered it, us, so Satan could no longer use death as, a, as one of his tools. I don't have to be afraid. I'm, I'm not, like, looking forward to dying by any means. Dying's not fun. Death is an enemy. But I don't have to be afraid of it because it's just a doorway to what Jesus has already conquered in my behalf. Perfect love, it says, drives out fear. When I'm operating under the love of God, I don't have to be afraid. And, and I know that my future is completely secure. I mean, what a, what a promise. You, having believed, were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So, I know my purpose. 
I know my needs are met. I don't have to be afraid. I know my future is secure. I, I want to tell you that this is what we call the abundant life. The American dream doesn't even hold a candle to this. We got so many people up building the American dream. You know, I'm in my dream home, and my dream vacation, my dream car, and my dream whatever, and I have financial security. Well, you really? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not in all those things. Those things can disappear like that. But we are secure in our Lord when we trust him. So I think, I think Paul introduced us this way to let us be in the right frame of mind to know who you are, to know God's love for you, to know that you can live for his purpose, you can live a life that you never dreamed of, and now you're ready to put on the new clothes, right? By the way, we do see faces as we look out across the crowd, but you don't see the bulk of people's bodies because what you see are people's clothes, and so when we're talking about these things that, that we're to put on, these are the things that people should see, right? They should see these character traits coming from us. So really, when you talk about putting on these new clothes, you're putting on what others should see in me, and we're putting on his character. What, what does his character look like? When we, we have this list here, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. We, we, have, we have this list, but I, I want you to know that it, it stems from whom our God is. You remember when Moses came down off the mountain and the children of Israel had gone astray and he broke the tablets and God was saying, I'm not going with you guys anymore. And Moses said, ah, God, this doesn't work. If you don't go with us, how will anybody know we're anything different? And then Moses asked God to see his face. I want to see you, God. God said, well, Moses, I can't let you do that. Just If you see me face to my face, the fullness of my glory, you'll die. But I'll tell you what you do. I'll put you in a cave. I'll, I'll cover you as I pass by. I'll let you see the backside of my glory. Well, what does God say as he passes by Moses? It's, it's recorded us. It's in Exodus 34 and verse 6. God says, I am, I am, I am. Yahweh, Yahweh. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and forgiving. That's, that's how God Almighty, God the Father, describes himself. Now, if you forward to the uh, book of Galatians, chapter 5, Paul describes the battle between the spirit and the flesh. And in chapter 5, he gives a description of the things that are of the flesh. And it's, it's a lovely list. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's not a lovely list. It's ugly. But he closes with that. He says, I want you instead to consider the fruit of the Spirit. What is it? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So God the Father has these traits. God the Spirit has these traits, and God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what does it say of him? It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because essentially, when you're putting on Jesus, you are putting on these character traits. If, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion Make my joy complete by being like-minded. A description of the character of Jesus. And that's really what, what our lives are to reflect. We're to reflect the character of Jesus in my life. People should see Jesus in us. That's the idea. So let's, uh, how he has treated us is how we should treat others. So let's just take a quick run through these. Um, he mentions his, his tender mercies or his compassion. Um, John writes in 1 John 3, 17, if, if anyone has material possessions and sees someone in need but takes no pity on him, how can the love of Father be in him? I mean, if you're in a place of ministering to somebody's needs, you have the resources to do so, and you see that need and just go, oh, well, somebody else can worry about that. 
I think there was a story about the Good Samaritan Jesus told. It was kind of like that, right? The guy left on this side of the road that the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side, and Jesus said, who was a, who was a neighbor to this man? It was the Samaritan who stopped and helped him out, right? Teaching us a lesson. He, he's comparing this to God. How, how can God's love be in you if you are not compassionate? Um, kindness. Kindness is something that is the character of Christ that we're to be seen um, Titus chapter 3, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. The kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. Who is it that appeared? It's, it's Jesus. Jesus, described as the kindness and love of God, appeared. What did he do? He saved us. Not because of anything we did, not because of our righteousness, but because of his mercy. That, that, that suggests to us that this kindness is to be shown not to those who deserve it, because I didn't deserve it. This kindness is to be shown to everyone, whether you think they deserve it or not. Have you ever looked at someone and said, well, they deserve what they're getting? And so when you've done that, have you turned around and said, God, just as they deserve what they're getting, I want you to give me what I deserve. Have you ever said that? Don't. <laughs> you don't want God to answer that request. And, and that's, that's how we look at others. We do so in, in humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And being found as a, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. We are to imitate the humility of Christ, who didn't, although he was exalted above all, took the lowest possible place to serve us. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Gentleness. Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says in 2 Corinthians 10, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. The one who, it says in Isaiah, when he came, would not even, you know, break a, 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 twig, a twig off. He wouldn't snuff out the, the light of the wick that was almost fading. In other words, he didn't care how broken you were. He didn't care how far you had, you had sunk. If you had a glimmer of life left in you, Jesus came to wrap you in his arms and be gentle with you to lead you toward himself in his life. And he was patient. Patient. That's a, may the Lord direct us, our hearts, into the love of God and the patience of Christ. <sighs> Ever have anybody try your patience? Wouldn't you love it if Jesus finally said, you know, I'm done. I've bailed you out so many times. I'm just through with you. You do that one more time, and you're out of here. How patient has Jesus been with me? And, and as Paul writes this, he, he, he then leads us into this idea of practicing forgiveness. Bearing with one another. Whatever grievance, whatever complaint you might have against somebody else, to let that go. La ladies and gentlemen, we are in this together. <laughs> you know how many people in this room have their lives all together? Not a single one of us.
we, we love it that our God is patient and forgiving of us. But sometimes we don't extend that same forbearance and patience and forgiveness to others. I mean, he's, he's very, very specific in our text. I mean, it's not, he's not leaving it. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. There's not much wiggle room there. Um, Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Let me ask you this question. How many of you deserve the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? I don't see any hands going up. (laughs) I don't deserve it, do I? But he gives it to us. So if you have this, and there there might be somebody in your life that's done something really horrible. And you're going, how can I forgive them? You can forgive them because God forgave you. And and I'll tell you, uh, not being willing to forgive, it destroys you more than anybody else because it builds that heart of bitterness, which is defiling to many. It eats away at you. And I just encourage you this morning, if there's somebody in your life that you have not forgiven, take that before the Lord this morning. Recognize God's forgiveness of you because as he forgave me, I am to forgive others, not because they deserve it, but because that's what our God does for us. And then he wraps this up with that priority of love, right? The, 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 the cloak that binds all this together in unity, this perfection that takes all this. It, it, it's really the love of Christ that, that flows through it. Jesus gave us a new command. Remember John chapter 13? A new command I give you that you love one another. Well, wait a minute, that's not new. That's way back in the Old Testament. But then he adds these words, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. We're talking about God's love, agape love that we are commanded to have. Love is, by the way, love has all those characteristics, right? Love's patient, kind, right? It, it doesn't keep track of wrongs. It, it always trusts, always believes, right? This is, this, is, this is the love of God that we're talking about that comes through us. Um, whoever does not love, it says, does not know God. Why? Because God is love, I I don't have that love, but I can know that love, and I can be an avenue of sharing that love, and it puts on all of these characteristics of us in perfect unity. And then he gives us just a couple more admonitions. One is, let the peace of God rule in your life. Peace of God ruling. Peace ruling in my life. What What does that look like? Well, it's a, Jesus said, I give you a peace that's not like the world. Um, he said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but I'm offering you a peace even in the midst of trouble. Um, have you memorized Philippians 4, 6, and 7 yet? Because if you haven't, you need to add that to your memory list because those are life verses, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with there, there it is again. There's, there's, that, there's that word. If, if you're in the midst of being anxious about something that's troubling you, how often is your heart feeling thankful? It's not because you're crying to me to come back. I've never had one not renew my mind. What am I going to do? Right? I mean, you, you can't help but have some anxiety. It's so anxiety is the, that feeling. It's what you do with it, right? You can go, and it can cripple you, or you can go, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I know you do. I know that you love me. I know that you'll take care of me. God, I don't, I don't know how you can work good out of this mess, but you promise me that you work all things together for good to those that love you, to those who are the called according to your purpose. And so, God, I, I want to stop right now and thank you. I'm not thanking you for what's happening. I'm thanking you for, God, how you're going to use this. Thank you for, God, what you're going to do. 
And, and what's the promise when we do that? The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. You probably need to only practice that verse when you're going through a tough time about every 30 seconds, okay? That's, that's, a, that's about how we work. But, but that's, that's, that gives us the peace. But I, I do want you to notice something in verse 15. He says, I, I want this peace of God to rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. So he, he's not just talking about me experiencing the peace ruling in my heart. He's talking about me experiencing the peace within the body of Christ. And that comes from humility and forgiveness and patience with one another as we, as we grow together. That's, that's what God wants us to experience in our, in our prayers. And finally, he, he, he says, you know, I want you in everything you do to praise him. Praise him in everything I do. The sacrifice of praise, Hebrew 13, is the fruit of lips that confess the name of Jesus. Lips that confess, that, that means my thoughts, my words, my actions should reveal to whom I belong. I, I get my thinking in the right place. When I get my thinking in the right place, what comes out of my mouth is the right thing, and what directs my steps is the right thing. And, and I can have Christ in me live through me that he might display himself. And so I, I get in the habit of praising him. He says, I want you to let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. I, I don't know about you, but I'm always blessed when the Roddy girls get up and rattle off these long passages of Scripture because they're taking God's word in. But, you know, the, the promise in Psalm 119.11, right? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You know, you can put, memorize the entire Bible and not get it down here. Right? I mean, it, it's great to memorize verses. Don't get me wrong. I think it's wonderful. It, it transformed my life when I started memorizing Scripture. I'm not discouraging it in any way. And I'm, I've watched it transform the lives of these young ladies as well. There's something about spending that time in His Word. It begins to seep in. It begins to take that meaning. But it needs to be something that you dwell in. And if you walk away from our time here this morning and apply none of this to your life, you may as well have slept in. It needs to be taken to heart in my life. It needs to be put into practice in my life. It needs to be allowing God. I, I need to saturate myself in God's Word because when you do, it'll build you up. That's, that's what the, the promise of the Word, Acts, 30, or Acts 20, 32 Paul, closing his time with the Ephesian elders, says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. When I, when I saturate myself in God's word, it's able to build me up. And, and he says, I want you to do this with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's, there's something about singing praises to our God that, that lift us up. Psalm 63, 4, I will... Praise you as long as I live, says David. In your name I will lift up my hands to you. Praise, praising God can lift you up. And then he closes with this verse, verse 17. Uh, it was posted in the men's bathroom. I don't know if it was posted in the girls' bathroom because I don't read it in there. Um, but it said this. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God, the Father through him. Seeking to honor God with everything. To the church in Philadelphia, Jesus said, I know your deeds, and I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you've kept my word and not denied my name. If I saturate myself in God's word, it will build me up if I sing songs of grateful praise unto him, it will lift me up. And if I seek to honor God in all I do, it will point me up. Do you remember where we started in Colossians 3? Set your hearts and minds on things above. 
It means taking off those old clothes and burning them. It means getting yourself right before God, confessing your sin. It means getting your heart and attitude in the right place that we might put on the new clothes of the Lord Jesus Christ and let him be seen through us. So just a question. What do people see in you? I've been accused by some of my children of becoming a grumpy old man. Man, I don't want that to be seen in me. What do people see? Do they see the joy of the Lord? Do they see a compassionate, kind, humble, forgiving person? What do they see? I mean, I, I mean I'm serious. You, you should ask yourself because it, if, if, people are, if you know that people aren't seeing the right thing, you need to say, I need to change the clothes. There's some stuff that needs to be removed and burned, and I need to put on a new set of clothes. If I am filled with his love and his praise and his thanksgiving, that's a healthy sign. That's a healthy sign that I am yielding my life to Christ. And I invite you to give yourself to him this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I uh, thank you um, for the challenge of this passage of Scripture. And I think every one of us in the room today can acknowledge that there are some areas that need to change. Lord, we're not going to make those changes on our own because our sin nature doesn't change. It does not get any better. I can't make it better. But what I can do is allow that nature and its desires to be crucified in Jesus Christ. God, I'm thankful that you love us. You loved us enough to die for us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay for our sins. God, if there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know that love, I pray that you would touch their heart this morning. They might be tired of living in the old grumpy self, complaining, unforgiving, angry, caught up in so many worries and cares about things that aren't important that they can't live for you. And Lord, we can't apart from receiving you into our lives. So we invite you, Lord. Take charge. Lord, I pray that the change would be seen in me. I pray that I would every morning consider which clothes I'm wearing. And I would take that raincoat or covering of love off the shelf, Lord, that you've poured into my life and say, Lord, I want this to be in the forefront of who I am and what I do. Forgive me. I want to live for Jesus, and I want Jesus to be seen in me through the power of your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see.
In the power of your love. 